Today we're going to be doing the current affairs now for the 8th of March. Now some of the topics that we'll be discussing are given over here. Now mostly uh, there are actually a lot of schemes that have to be discussed today. Uh, the scheme and then donate a pension scheme and then the Swatantra Sainik Samman Yojana. So there are three schemes. Apart from that we'll discuss about the governor's address and then why the rupee has been sinking. Recently the rupee has sunk to lesser than rupees. 77 a dollar now why is it sinking and then about the nari shakti puraskars okay the most important topic being the rupee sinking to as low as uh, 77 rupees uh, and also the role of uh, governor's address now the first scheme is kanya siksha pravesh utsav this scheme is to try and attract those students who have left education girl students especially to try and bring them back into the fold of education. Now it is under the Ministry of Women and Child Development and it is being rolled in partnership with UNICEF. Okay. On. on the eve of the International Women's Day, the Ministry of Women and Child Development has launched the Kanya Siksha Pravesh Utsav, a scheme to bring back out of school girls back into the education system. The objective is to bring back out of school adolescent girls into the formal education or skilling system, not just education, but also into vocational system, which is nothing but skilling. Okay. Now, adolescent girls as in those girls between the ages of 11 to 14, because in India under the Right to Education Act, education is free until the age of 14. The campaign has been launched with the objective of enhancing enrollment and retention of girls between 11 to 14 years of age in the schools. The initiative aims to build on the existing schemes and programs for uh, girl education like Scheme for Adolescent Girls, Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, National Education Policy, etc. Okay. Now the campaign will be rolled out under the umbrella of, umbrella of Beti Bachao, Beti Padao initiative. So under the Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, you have Sukanya, Sam Sukanya Samriddhi Yojana. Okay, which talks about uh, investing a particular amount of money every year into the girl child's account, bank account. And then apart from this Sukanya Samriddhi, now we also have this Kanya Siksha Prabhu which talks about retaining women in the education system, girls in the education system, adolescent girls. And it targets around 4 lakh girls. Okay. Now, the other government efforts towards women education in India are Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, like what we just spoke of. It aims to create awareness and also improve the welfare services of the girl child in order to increase the child sex ratio and also to improve girl education, two major uh, okay, two major uh, outcomes uh, out of this Beti Bachao, Beti Padao scheme. The initial aim of the campaign was to address the declining child sex ratio, but later it also included propagating education, survival and protection of the girl child. Now, Digital Gender Atlas, it is under the Ministry of HRD, which is now renamed as Ministry of Education under the National Education Policy 2019. Ministry of Education, okay, please remember this. Now, what is this Digital Gender Atlas? This Digital Gender Atlas, it has a mapping of the entire country and it maps out those... Uh, regions within the country which have lower uh, girl education like say for example these districts now these districts will be in a different color as compared to those districts which have a higher percentage of girl education happening and then Sarva Siksha Abhiyan I'm sure all of you know what Sarva Siksha Abhiyan is it's a overarching scheme and this includes under this you have also midday meals uh, and you have several other programs under the Sarvasiksha Abhiyan. It ensures greater participation of girls in elementary education. 
Sarva Siksha Abhiyan has targeted interventions for girls which include opening of schools, appointment of additional women teachers, separate toilets for girls, teacher sensitization programs, etc. Also, Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyalayas have been opened in educationally backward blocks under the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan itself. So, this is also an umbrella scheme. Just like how Beti Bachao Beti Padao is an umbrella scheme under which we have other schemes for girls. Sarva Siksha Abhiyan is also an umbrella scheme. And under that, we have several uh, initiatives. Apart from that, we have Rashtriya Madhyamik Siksha Abhiyan. Like how Sarva Siksha Abhiyan is for elementary education. Rashtriya Madhyamik Siksha Abhiyan is for middle level schooling or secondary schools. Uh, it provides a secondary school within a reasonable distance of every habitation and improves the quality of education imparted at the secondary level. Okay. Then Udan scheme. Udan scheme has been launched by the Central Board of Secondary Education and it provides free online resources to girl students of class 11th and 12th for preparation for competitive exams like IIT, like AIEEE, then uh, NEET etc okay now all these medical uh, all these exams competitive exams the cbsc will provide online resources for girl students okay uh, please try to read all the schemes which are related to women and girl children because they come under vulnerable sections uh, as you can see in india and hence uh, usually upsc picks questions which are targeting the vulnerable sections next moving on Chaos erupts in the West Bengal Assembly. Now, the customary governor's address on the opening day of the budget session of a state assembly was mired in controversy recently in West Bengal and Telangana. Okay, when do we have this governor's address? There are two instances for governor's address to compulsorily happen. Okay, uh, as under in the case of state assemblies, under Article 176 of the Constitution, it says that the Governor shall address both the houses assembled together at the commencement of first session after each general election to the assembly and at the commencement of the first session of each year and inform the legislature of the causes of its summons. So it has been explicitly given in the Constitution that there shall be two times when the Governor shall definitely constitute a session, a joint session of the assembly. First thing is when after elections and the second thing is the first session each year. The same thing holds good even for the president and I believe it is given under article 87 of the Indian Constitution. Please read it. Also, what happened in the case of West Bengal? In the case of West Bengal, Mr. Jagdeep Dankar, who is the current governor of West Bengal, he was unable to deliver his address at the Vidhan Sabha on the first day of the budget session because of the protests which were happening. In Telangana, the budget session of the state assembly commenced without the governor's address at all. The governor's address was cut out actually. Here the address didn't even happen. And the governor expressed discontent over the state government's decision to not have the governor's address at the beginning of the session. Now, okay, what is this address of the governor? What does it usually contain? Even an address of the president or the address of a governor contains usually three different things. First thing is the review and activities and achievements of the government during the previous year. These are highlighted. Okay, then it also talks about the government's policies and priorities and plans for the upcoming year in the future. Okay, and this gives a gives the direction that the government is going to follow in the future. Also, it talks about the program of the government's business for that particular session. What is the government going to do in the budget session or the first session in every year? So, this is the reason why the address is very important. Otherwise, there won't be any idea as to what the government has achieved or what the government uh, plans to achieve in the upcoming year. Yeah. 
after the governor's address is over on the first day on which the discussion on the address of the governor begins a copy of the address of the governor is laid on the table of the house a copy of whatever the governor gave in his address speech is published in the gazette and it is laid within the house presence like a bill is laid it is introduced into the house now the speaker in consultation with the business advisory committee uh, allots time for the discussion of the matters within the governor's address he says that on which day what are the matters in the governor's address that have to be discussed after that a motion of thanks a motion is moved by a member and it is seconded by another member thanking the governor for the address now on this particular motion there is a general discussion regarding any aspect of the administration and also matters which are in the governor's address now members during this particular uh, general discussion they may move amendments to the motion of thanks in such form as considered appropriate by the speaker and now after amendments are moved if these amendments are accepted then they become a part of that motion of thanks and finally that motion of thanks is put to vote now what is the difference between resolutions and motions please remember that resolutions are always voted upon while motions are sometimes not voted upon not voted okay uh next only if this motion of thanks is passed by uh, the assembly then it means that the government can continue to be in power otherwise it requires that the government has to prove its majority in the assembly it puts the working of the government in a question okay moving on next rupee sinks to record low as oil prices spike now the rupee sank to a record low of almost 77 rupees as against the us dollar now why did this happen currently the reason why the indian rupee has plunged to such a low is because of the russia ukraine conflict which actually sent the crude oil prices to a 14 year high currently the crude oil prices are more than 115 dollars okay prompting safe haven flows into the dollar whenever there is a crisis usually in the world market often people they try to invest in uh things which are safe now what are the things that are safe the us dollar has been considered a very safe currency to invest in because of its resilience and its demand and hence during times of crisis people actually invest in the us dollar and hence this particular demand for the us dollar increases also people invest in gold during times of crisis so that is the meaning of safe haven flows now uh, the rupee closed trading on monday at 76.93 76 pi is weaker than its previous close the parabolic rise in the crude oil prices towards multi year highs and spiraling commodity prices are fueling inflationary risks which is a key headwind for rupee dollar exchange rate because of this inflation you know the rupee price has been dipping significant outflows from the domestic equities tracking global queues are also weighing in on the domestic currency what happens whenever people are selling off domestic equities why are they selling it so that they can take it back into to the us uh, so these foreign investors what they do is during times of crisis because it's not just a phenomenon that is happening in india it is happening all across the world as you can see over here it says global queues even around the world even in uh, chinese uh, stock index index shanghai uh, stock exchange or the sgx which is a singapore one or the nikkei in japan people are selling off uh, you know equity and they are moving back to their original countries to the us so uh, hence you know they sell it off 
they get rupees and they convert this rupees into dollars to send it back so the demand for dollars has been increasing while the demand for rupees has been falling also higher trade deficits lead to depreciation india's exports have been constrained because of the covid pandemic and because whenever you have trade deficit it means that your exports are not doing really well then you can't get any foreign exchange and if you can't get foreign exchange automatically your uh, domestic currency's value will keep depreciating domestic currency depreciates so all these are multiple factors which are resulting in the rupee uh, falling uh, like say for example the crude oil prices or the inflation commodity prices and then outflows from domestic equities and also uh, safe haven flows into the dollar and into gold and higher trade deficit so many reasons are actually causing the rupee to fall now what is this impact of depreciation of the indian rupee depreciation is not just a bad thing please remember that depreciation can also be a good thing actually a lot of uh, countries around the world they go for uh, voluntarily depreciating their currency they intervene and then they re- reduce the you know the value of their currency because uh, this re- reduced currency supports exports so depreciation of rupee is a double edged sword a weaker currency supports exports amid a nascent economic recovery from the pandemic but also it causes significant risk because it can result in imported inflation which means that imports become extremely expensive you need to put more number of rupees in order to uh, import the same uh, uh, same quantity which was worth the same number of dollars and it may make it difficult for the central bank to also maintain interest rates at a record low for a longer amount of time only when the interest rates are low can there be more easy borrowing and there can be more growth however if there is high inflation and if there is lower uh, uh, you know value of the currency uh, the central bank will be forced to increase its interest rates and that will affect the growth prospects now however you know devaluation and depreciation are two different things okay devaluation is basically something that is done uh, they are used interchangeably but they actually are very different devaluation is actually done voluntarily by the central bank while depreciation happens by itself there is no intervention of any country they both have the same effect that is a fall in the value of the currency which makes imports more expensive and exports more competitive however there is a difference a devaluation occurs when the country's central bank makes a consci- conscious decision to lower the exchange rate in a fixed or semi fixed exchange rate this is done in order to make exports more competitive and increase the growth rate however a depreciation is when there is a fall in the value of a currency in the floating exchange rate scenario now moving on the next scheme donate a pension scheme a donate a pension scheme was launched under the ministry of labor and employment this is the nodal ministry the union labor and employment ministry launched the donate a pension scheme allowing any citizen to pay the premium amount on behalf of an organized unorganized worker under the Pram, pradhan mantri shram yogi mandan scheme so any person can donate you know the pension amount for an or unorganized worker on behalf of that person okay now donate a pension scheme allows a citizen to to donate premium contribution of their immediate support staff such as domestic workers drivers helpers caregivers in their household or establishment like you can also take it up and you can pay the premium of people who are working in your house or in your establishment the donor can pay the contribution for a minimum of 1 year it is a minimum of 1 year with the amount ranging from rupees 660 to 2400 rupees a year i believe it is 55 rupees per month 
uh, uh, yeah, just uh, check on these numbers. This is per year and per month it is 55 rupees and uh, 200 rupees, I guess. Okay, uh, yeah, 200 rupees, depending on the age of the beneficiary. The premium amount can be paid either through mandan.in or visiting a common services center. Common services centers are under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Now, what is this Pradhan Mantri Shram Yogi Mandan scheme? It is nothing but a 50-50 voluntary and contributory pension scheme, which means that if the uh, if the beneficiary makes 50% of the contribution, the government makes the rest 50% of the contribution. Okay, the central government matches it. And the Ministry of Labor and Employment, it oversees this Pradhan Mantri Shram Yogi Mandan scheme. And it is implemented by the LIC and the Common Services Center E-Governance Services India Limited. This is a special purpose vehicle which was established in order to implement the Pradhan Mantri Shram Yogi Mandan scheme. It is implemented by both these entities. Now, who is eligible? Workers working in the unorganized sector in the age group of 18 to 40 years can only register themselves and deposit a minimum of 660 to 2400 rupees every year depending on their age. Whatever is the amount of money they deposit, equivalent amount of money is also deposited by the central government. Okay, They should not be covered under the new pension scheme, the Employee State Insurance Corporation scheme or the Employee Provident Fund Organization. Further, he should also not be an income tax payer. So these are the conditions in order to be eligible for the scheme. What are the benefits after, uh, you know, contributing to the scheme? After attaining, they won't get immediate benefits because a pension is that way only. You get it after a particular age. After attaining 60 years of age, they'll receive the minimum assured pension of rupees 3000. However, the pension can also be more than this depending upon what you are contributing. If you are contributing, say 2400 rupees, this you will get if you are contributing uh, 55 rupees per month or 660 rupees per year however if you are contributing more than that you get more uh, correspondingly please remember the scheme and it is under the ministry of uh, labor swatantra sainik samman yojana the government of india has continued the continuation of the swatantra sainik samman yojana and its components for finance till financial years 2025-26 now the proposal for continuation was received from the Ministry of Home Affairs. So this has to be the nodal ministry for the scheme. Remember, it is not under the Ministry of Defense, rather it is under the Ministry of Home Affairs. The scheme aims to provide a monthly Samman pension to freedom fighters for their contribution in the national freedom struggle and after their demise to their eligible dependents such as spouses and unmarried and unemployed daughters and dependent partners okay only for spouses and unmarried and unemployed daughters remember this freedom fighters and their eligible dependents have been sanctioned the swatantra sainik samman pension and presently there are more than 23000 beneficiaries under the scheme the amount of pension has been revised from time to time and also a dearness relief has been given since 2016. It is very, it's just important from the prelims perspective, not from the mains perspective. Uh, so please remember that it has been revised from time to time and also the dearness relief is included in the scheme. Repolling in six Manipur booths today. Okay. Uh, we had discussed about repolling in one of the constituencies in the in in Tamil Nadu for the urban elections. Now, after the Manipur State Assembly elections happened recently, and however, there is a re-election happening in some of these uh, polling booths uh, because of EVMs being snatched and other irregularities. Okay. In the case of elections to the Lok Sabha and the Assembly elections, it is the Election Commission which can order re-polling based on the reports of the returning officer. 
we had earlier discussed who a returning officer is who a chief electoral officer is okay uh, who a district election officer is and all of that uh, please refer to the previous uh, video regarding who the uh, returning officer is okay according to the representation of people's act 1951 section 58a says that booth if booth capturing has taken place at a polling station or at a place fixed for the poll or if booth capturing takes place at any place for counting of votes in such a manner that the result of the poll gets up, uh, affected then only in these two uh, cases then the returning officer shall forward a report to the election commission now it is only the election commission after the receipt of the report from the returning officer that can either declare that the poll at that polling station was void and appoint a particular day for taking a fresh poll or if it is satisfied that in view of the large number of polling stations or places involved in booth capturing the result of the election is likely to be affected or that booth capturing had affected counting of votes in such a manner as to the as to affect the result of the election countermand the election order repoll in that entire constituency okay now either you order a, a repoll in that particular polling station only or if there is a large number of places where there is booth capturing and there is fraud fraud in the counting of votes then it can order a repoll in that entire constituency so it is up to the election commission to decide whatever it wants to decide it is very powerful in that sense but this is done only after the report of the returning officer now who is the returning officer the returning officer of a parliamentary or assembly constituency is responsible for the conduct of elections in that parliamentary or assembly constituency he is in charge of that constituency alone while a chief electoral officer is in charge for the elections in the entire state and the district electoral officer is responsible for elections in the entire district it is the election commission of india which nominates or designates an officer of uh, of the government as the returning officer in consultation with the state government in addition the election commission of india also appoints one or more assistant returning officers for each of the assembly and the parliamentary constituencies to assist the returning officer the election commission can designate or nominate the same person to be the returning officer for more than one constituency please remember all these tidbits regarding who the returning officer is it is the election commission of india that appoints a returning officer for each constituency now moving on nari shakti puraskar okay uh, now this is there in the news because recently the nari shakti puraskars for two years both the year 2020 and the year 2021 they were conferred by the president of india at the rashtrapati bhavan the award ceremony for the year 2020 could not be held in 2021 due to the covid situation and hence around 28 awards 14 for 2020 and 14 for 2021 will be presented to the individuals for their exceptional work in rendering distinguished services towards empowerment of women especially the vulnerable and the marginalized women it's only for those people this nari shakti puraskar is nothing but an initiative of the ministry of women and child development so it is the ministry of women and child development that recognizes and selects people for the award nari shakti puraskar and that is this is the highest award uh for uh, recognizing women it is the highest civilian award for recognizing the achievements of women now it is an initiative of the ministry of women and child development to acknowledge the exceptional contribution made by individuals and institutions please remember not just individuals but rather even institutions such as ngos such as civil society organizations and all to celebrate women as game changers and catalyst of positive change in the society 
the winners of the nari shakti puraskar for 2020 and 2021 they can be from any field basically m- many of them are given such as entrepreneurship agriculture innovation social work arts and crafts stem wildlife conservation and not just this uh, being a part of the navy merchant navy being a part of uh, tribal welfare anything as long as they are empowering individual women or they are helping in the skilling of women you know all of those people and all of those institutions are recognized with the nari shakti puraskar now what is this award it was initiated in the year 1999 it had a different name back then but now it has been renamed as nari shakti puraskar it is the highest civilian honor for women in india it is the president of india who confers the nari shakti puraskar on the international women's day though it is the ministry of women and child development that selects them it is the president who confers these awards on those people and it carries an award of rupees 2 lakh and a certificate for institutions which are ngos and civil society organizations or companies and it carries a gift of 1 lakh rupees and a certificate for individuals who have helped in empowerment of women the ministry of women and child development announces these national level awards for individuals groups ngos institutions etc as per the guidelines only individuals of age 25 years and above and institutions that have worked in the relevant field for at least 5 years are eligible to apply only these can get these awards no one else is eligible to apply for these awards thank you